And welcome back to Your Killer Life. I'm your host, Tammy Grable Woodford, and I'm so glad you're joining us again for another amazing episode. I have a guest today, and the topic we're covering is really, really important. It's one that we, I actually don't know a lot about. I'm going to just come out and say, but it's a super important topic that is something that is discussed quite often. I think that there's probably a lot of misinformation, but it was also something that was really raised to, uh, high level of attention and awareness with some celebrities that had this diagnosis. So as we've talked about before on Your Killer Life, more than one type of breast cancer. And today we have with us Kristen Williams, and she is with Bracket Chatter. She is a video blogger. Oh my goodness, her YouTube channel is amazing. You got to check it out. And we are going to be talking about Bracca today. So Kristen, thank you so much for joining me on the Your Killer Life podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. I cannot wait to to dig into your story because you have you are first of all the way that you have just tackled this uh, mm-hmm. diagnosis with humor, with candor, with openness, awareness, and you just like kicked into advocacy mode, which is absolutely amazing. So tell us a little bit about how you discovered that you had bracket and what the heck bracket is for anyone listening that doesn't know. (laughs) What the heck does it mean? Yeah. So, um, I, first of all, thank you. I love the fact that people notice me for my humor around it because so it's such a, it, it can be a really depressing thing and it gets people down. And so many people contact me saying that I make them laugh. And I'm like, that's great. Yes. <laughs> because, you know, if you can find any positive in bad situations, then it just makes it so much easier to cope with. So thank you. Um, but I lost my mum to ovarian cancer. She, um, it's about five years ago or just over five years ago and because she was of quite a young age she was 62 when she died they tested her for this genetic mutation because they said it was quite unusual but in terms of the rest of our family we didn't have much cancer so it was quite a shock to find out um the only other person who had cancer was my great auntie marge and she lived until she was like 94 so it wasn't like because a lot of a lot of women and men kind of say, oh, yeah, it runs in the family. I've always been worried about it. But it was a bit of a shock for us. Um, and she found out just before she died. So like three weeks before she died. So she never found out the rest of the family. And I went for testing almost straight away. And <laughs> they were trying to put me off and said, this is a bit soon. You've just lost your mum. And I was like, just tell me. I, I, I assume I have it anyway. Um, and unfortunately, I did. So that was kind of like how I found out about it. Um, and really, at the time, I didn't I didn't know anybody. I didn't know anybody who'd been through it. It was a very unusual thing. Um, you know, my friends are absolutely brilliant, but it's a very hard thing to support somebody with because you just, you, I think a lot of people are stumped. They don't know what to say. <laughs> they don't know what advice to give. Right. So, yeah, I found it quite a bit of a lonely place, really. So that is why I started raising my own awareness, just so that I could help other young women in my situation, really. Um, so should I talk a little bit about what it is? And yes, it please, please. So the actual BRCA, B-R-C-A, stands for breast cancer. But that's a little bit confusing because it doesn't just affect the breasts. So as I said, my mum died of ovarian cancer. So there are links to breast, ovarian, um, and then with BRCA2, which is what I have, there are links to pancreatic, I believe. Mm. Um, There's some suggestions about skin melanomas, um, and it really depends where you read. (laughs) I've read a very long list of suspected cancers the other day, which kind of scared me a little bit. But the BRCA gene everybody has. And that's really important. So when people say I have BRCA, everybody has BRCA. What people mean is I have a BRCA mutation. So our BRCA genes that everybody has in their body, they are really useful and they basically work as tumor suppressors. So whenever there's a like hint of something going wrong, your BRCA gene comes along and sorts things out. That's the simple way of putting it. So they're protector genes, basically. 
if that gene is then mutated, you are more susceptible to getting these types of cancers. So it doesn't mean you're going to get them, but the chances are much, much higher. Um, for me, BRCA2, I had, depending what stats you look at, but I had up to 85% chance, lifetime mm. chance of developing breast cancer. So pretty scary. Um, and then ovarian, I think, is between 10 and 20%. And it's a little bit higher for BRCA1. Um, And I guess one of the sad and unfortunate things is the cancers that are associated with the BRCA genes usually are metastatic. So they've spread quite quickly. Um, So, yeah, it's there. And the younger I read this somewhere, I don't know, you might be able to clarify this, but the younger you get it, the more quickly it will spread because you're especially with breast cancer, your boobs are less dense is that right so as you get older they change shape and things don't spread as quickly so I remember reading that so it basically means that the the cancers you do get are quite aggressive um so it's kind of like it's a predisposition predisposition to cancer and I guess one of the things that shocked me and especially with my mum is always 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 advocate having a healthy lifestyle of course but I remember saying to my genetic counselor you know what if I stop drinking what if I become vegan what if I do all of these things and she said it's not environmental it's not an environmental cancer so by all means do all of that stuff but that isn't necessarily going to prevent your genes from being the way they well it isn't going to prevent that um and that was something with my mum as well she was just such a healthy person and not, yeah, she just, you would never have expected that. It was such a shock for her. She never drank, never smoked, never t- taken drugs, everything. She did everything by the book and she still got cancer. So that's really difficult because it's not, yeah, it, it kind of feels like you're going to get it anyway. That's kind of what she said to me. <laughs> she always said, it's not if, it's when. So, yeah, it's quite scary. Yeah. That. I am truthfully amazed at how many women I talked to and myself included, I was same thing. Didn't drink, didn't smoke, yeah. ate organic food, worked out every day, you know, so like ticking all the health boxes and still ended up diagnosed with cancer and, and with breast cancer. And so it is an interesting, um, advocacy and educational moment that, that it, you know, as much as we would like to say, well, just don't do that thing and you're fine with breast cancer. That is just not yeah. the case. And it's, and it's, I, it gets really frustrating when we go down that route, because then I feel like there's a, a blame. That's what a lot of people think. What yeah. did I do wrong? Or where yeah. did I, you know, was it because I drank that glass of wine last week? I think it becomes very blaming when we do, do, do that or think about the environmental factors and yeah. Yeah. I agree with you. And there's an element of trying to get some control back too. I know that, you know, after I was diagnosed, like, what can I change as if there was some sort of magic sauce of, if I change, if I go vegetarian or vegan versus right, like what, what can I remove from my life or what should I be putting into my life so that I can fix this? And, and it just doesn't work like that. <laughs> no, it doesn't. And it is, it has, that's, that has happened to me since having my operation is that I feel like I'll talk about my operation a little bit, but I've gone through such measures to remove cancer from my breasts. Now, every time I do anything that's bad for my body, I feel guilty because I'm mm-hmm. like, I've gone through this whole operation and I'm drinking wine. <laughs> Why would I do that to myself? So <laughs> there's, with any of this, it's so much about your mental health and it's all about psychology and what you're thinking you know it's it's not your it's not just your body that's impacted not at uh, all no it's it's, it's about the mind it is it is uh, a, a whole, all encompassing when it comes to yes. your person and yes. so when you're diagnosed with BRCA, you're now faced with some decisions so for me it was pretty well laid out you've got tumors you need to have them removed and so when you were diagnosed I'm sure you went through screening did they find anything did you 
uh, have a prophylactic mastectomy or did you find tumors that would cause you to have that? Or did you just sit and wait? You said surgery. So I'm assuming, um, mm-hmm. and I did look at your YouTube channel, so I do kind of know, but I don't want to wreck it for everybody, <laughs> you know, because it is a big part of the story and you do have decisions that you can make. And some women, especially younger women, they'll, you know, they'll sort of stay the course and go mm-hmm. with monitoring. And some women are like, nope, let's just, Let's just remove all possibility to the best of our ability. And so how, what decisions did you make and how did you go about making those? Mm. So that was, that was the difficult part, isn't it? And I know a lot of doctors said to me, this is so hard. If you have cancer, that decision is taken off you. So it's kind of like you don't have a choice but to have operations. And when you're faced with this, it's like you've got a probability of getting cancer, but you're still healthy. So what do you do? And that is the dilemma that a lot of women are faced with. Um, so it's it's different in US. It's different in UK. It's different in different parts of the UK. Like mm-hmm. our response across the NHS really depends where you live and what services they have and what surgeons they have. It's very very confusing to navigate it all so for me I was 27 when I found out and they basically said we're not going to do anything till you're 30 nothing till you're 30 for other people I know they said we're not even going to test you until you're 30 because we're not going to do anything till then but if you think about it I, I had my operation just after 30 so if you haven't found out till you're 30 you've then got years to think about whether you want the operation so it's different across the country. Um, but I did put it out of my head for three years. I really did because I was like, ah, it's not a high risk, like, which is untrue. I know women who've been diagnosed in their late 20s. Um, so my thought process at the time, I was 27 and I was in a stable relationship and I really wanted to breast- breastfeed. I, hadn't, I didn't have kids, but I thought, you know, that was on the cards and that was something that was quite important to me. I loved my boobs. I had 28 double Fs, <laughs> depending on the day. I really, you know, they were really a big part of me, basically. Um, and then as time went on, I wasn't having children. It just wasn't right for me and my partner. And then we felt that there was a lot of pressure for us to have kids just so I could breastfeed, just so I could have an operation. So we at the time sat down and had this conversation, just thought practically get it over and done with before I have commitments of having children before I'm, you know, working part time and not having the the finances. It was just, it was a really, really practical decision. And it, it'd been hanging over me, even though I, I hadn't thought about it for three years, it was still always there it was still kind of following me around and it was like my friends kept asking me about what you're going to do. And a lot of my friends at that stage as well started having children and some of them were having trouble breastfeeding and they were like, what if you do all of this, have a baby and then you can't even breastfeed? How, how would you feel? And then, you know, quite bluntly, one of them right. said, what if you get breast cancer when your child is one years old, what are you going to do then? So I was having all of these questions put towards me and it, it kind of just snowballed. I had a, an appointment with the plastic surgeon just to talk to him, <laughs> just to talk to him. And I skipped out like, I'll have a mastectomy. Why not? <laughs> just, it was weird. It was kind of like, I kind of felt like my life was on hold. I was just waiting for this thing to happen. And I know What you were saying earlier is that it's it's hard because we're healthy, but it's brilliant because we have opportunities. We it is, you know, knowledge is power, and the fact that you know you've got a predisposition to cancer means you can do something about it. You don't have to, you know, wait. And I I said I've written a blog recently, and it, it was like most people who get diagnosed with cancer probably say, "If only I knew this was going to happen." And I think if most people who were diagnosed with cancer were said, would you have done something to prevent this? They would all say yes. They really would. Because at the end of the day, if you have breast cancer, you're you're likely with BRCA to have mastectomy anyway. Right. And part of it for me, they, they basically said, if you 
this sounds really shallow of me, <laughs> but they said if you were to get breast cancer, you're unlikely to be able to have a reconstruction because I haven't got any fat on my body. <laughs> And right. they don't like putting silicon under the skin if they've done radiotherapy because it's, you know, not strong enough. So in a very shallow way, I thought, well, I can get a better kind of reconstruction if I do it now. It wasn't about like my life and, you know, I might die. It was like, I'll get a better boob out of it. <laughs> okay. But yeah. I'm going to stop. I'm going to say time out because it's not vanity. It is identity. It is your, it is your self-awareness. It is your self-confidence. It's your self-esteem. It is your sexuality, your sensuality. It is how you, it is relevant how it is as we walk through our reconstruction and as it is, you know, for me, I had, I also had implant reconstruction and it took us a couple surgeries to get as good as it's going to get, which is pretty good. And I also loved my breasts. I had great breasts. It was tragic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what a waste. <laughs> and that, that's how I felt. Tragedy. <laughs> <laughs> But, and, but, you know, at first I couldn't even say that, right. Because it felt so vain to actually appreciate my own body, to be okay with my own sense about to be complimentary of myself. Right. Because we're all supposed to be so humble and not talk yes. like that. So yeah. that makes sense to me. And I was the, the same way. Part of my decision-making process is I couldn't have done the tissue reconstruction at the time. Mm -hmm. I didn't have enough body fat either. And, and that's something that I, I just had an amazing plastic surgeon on for episode 17 and we talked through the various types of reconstruction, which I'm so glad they're, they're actually making so much headway in that area. And especially with yeah. numbness and, and being able to get some sensation back, but it's amazing. Uh, That's the difference. One thing I think different in America is that you guys are given a choice <laughs> more so because a lot of women has co have contacted me from America saying, how did you make a decision? What, you know, they you get given loads of information you choose. I'm like, I don't really feel like we have a choice in the UK. It's like, we've got the NHS and it's whatever your surgeon says is best is best. So wow. That, I mean, that's an important note for any UK yeah. listeners is that yeah. You have a choice you do you can pick any surgeon in the UK and you can get referred to different hospitals and I think we are less likely to do that because we feel like our NHS is so you know fantastic and wonderful that you don't want to question it so <laughs> but that is important because for some women they have a real strong you know feeling towards a certain type of reconstruction and that they should be able to get that if that's really how they feel definitely yeah. So you, then you went through, you had your bilateral mastectomies, yeah. you went through reconstruction yeah. and did you make any decisions with your ovaries or any of your other potential risk areas? Not yet. So this, I had my operation, what, nine months ago now. And I, first of all, I'm, I'm very, very happy with how it's turned out. Something that you are anxious about for so long, so many years, and anxiety, whatever it is, is always worse in your head than it is in real life. So that's, you know, one key message to give people is that you will be okay and you will learn to love yourself and all of that stuff. So I am really happy with how that has, you know, how I look. Um, awesome. the ovaries, so unfortunately during that whole process me and my partner split up mm -hmm. so that's kind of it's changed things a little bit in terms of my I guess time scales of thinking about you know having a family and all of that stuff um but the options for ovaries is they've got a new thing at the moment where they remove the tubes or tie the tubes because apparently most ovarian cancers start within the fallopian tubes mm -hmm. so if they remove the ovaries first, that will that will um, lead you into pre-induced menopause or surgical menopause, which can be, you know, horrific for the body. Yes. Menopause generally, you know, is just so many different symptoms. But when it's pre-induced, they're kind of like really heightened. So the whole idea behind removing or tying or cutting the tubes is that you delay that hope for natural menopause and then remove the ovaries at a later stage. Um, so they're doing quite a few studies 
around that in the UK at the moment. I'm not sure what's going on in the US. Um, and that also means that you can still obviously have babies because you're not removing right. your ovaries. Yeah. So that is an option. Um, the other thing which they have spoken to me about, but obviously I'm not planning it at the moment, is um, is it PGD or PDG? <laughs> Let's get them mixed up, which is a type of IVF um, where they basically remove your eggs and they have the embryos outside of the body and then they test them. So they would only implant the ones which did not have a BRCA mutation. Wow. So, yeah, it's pretty incredible, pretty incredible. Um, but that's a real, again, a real dilemma. The success rate is like 30%. It goes up each time you try a cycle, but, you know, it's, it's still you know, 30%. So that's a very, I guess, traumatic thing to go through right. as a couple and on your body and all of that stuff. And then there's the whole dilemma about, well, I've got BRCA. <laughs> you know, I've got BRCA. If my mum did that, then I wouldn't be around. It's that sort of... <laughs> Right. Yeah, it's, it's a very, very personal decision. So obviously everybody is going to approach that differently. Some people might say, well, I wouldn't want my child to have to go through all of this. People like me, I'm very, uh, what will be or be. I'm very hopeful for the future that when I do have children and they're older, there'll be so many different like miracle right. <laughs> cures for everything. Um, but that's an option as well. And one thing they told me, um, with this, they told me this five years ago, um, that they can also test once you're pregnant, they can mm. test the fetus to see if it has BRCA and you have a choice of a termination. So I have said that to a few women and some women across the UK have said that's not been said to me and others have said, yep, they told me that. So that's quite, yeah. Again, that's the whole feeling. Well, then my mum would have aborted me. But again, it's, you know, what's right for each individual. Right. And interestingly, you can't test children until they turn 18. So you could test an unborn baby and find out it has BRCA. And then if you choose to keep that baby, you'll always know it's got BRCA. But you can't just test a child until they're 18. You Definitely in the UK. Not sure about the US, but... Yeah. Oh, see, now you're going to send me down a research rabbit hole once, <laughs> once we're done recording, because I'm really curious about that. I'm wondering if it's the amniotic fluid or something that, that, that would, t I don't know. See, now I'm all curious. Yeah. yeah. Those are tough decisions. So when you are diagnosed with BRCA and you were saying, so with two, it was an 85% chance of breast cancer. If you yeah. have bracket, if you're diagnosed with BRCA2 or have the BRCA2 mutation. Yeah. And is that 85% for women only, or is that 85% chance there also for men? Because I know that uh, in one of my previous episodes, the male breast cancer survivor that I had uh, spoken with was a BRCA, had BRCA mutation. Yeah. So the stats I have in my brain it's 85% chance lifetime risk for women. And it is, I believe, 7% for men. Oh, wow. And okay. the average, a woman without a BRCA mutation has a 12% chance. They're, they're the stats that I know in my head. So it is still increased for men because I think men without BRCA is like zero, zero point something or one. It's like really, really low. So yeah. it's much higher with BRCA, but it's still lower than a than the average woman, basically. Much lower than, yeah, yeah. the average woman. Wow. So mm -hmm. that is so much information. Can we talk mental health for a minute? Of course. <laughs> because, you know, I know for me when, and I had the feeling, like I had watched changes in my breast. And by the time I made my appointment, honestly, it was Dr. Google and I, and we figured yeah. that out, made the appointment with the gynecologist and so when the radiologist said to me, it's cancer, I said, oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> it was just validation. But it was still from a mental health perspective, this whole process was so, so challenging. I was always amazed at how quickly, and, and I, I hate to say easily, but this is relatively speaking, how much more easy it was for my physical body to just accommodate and heal and, and go about its business. And mentally, it felt like pretty much stepping into the Coliseum on a pretty regular basis and going to battle with, 
with my myself. And so you're healthy. I was healthy. You're healthy. You look healthy. You feel healthy. You're doing all the right things. You have this information. Part of you wants to get right on that Kubler Ross, uh, you know, grief thing and say to yourself, I'm just going to hang out in denial for a while. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> Let me process all of this. <laughs> exactly. So can you talk with us about some of the tools? I, I'm assuming that video blogging was one way of just kind of getting it out there and facing and processing. Yeah. It was such a bizarre feeling doing all of that because I was so, you know, I, I said to you earlier, I was trying to learn how to even edit videos and record. I'd never done any of that before. So it was a real learning experience and I threw myself into it, but it was partly a distraction, even though all I was, do- I was talking about BRCA, everything I was recording was about BRCA, my own journey, all of that. But I was also detached from it at the same time. So I was learning all of this stuff, but it was like I was doing it for other people, not for myself. Right. Which, do you know what? That That's... That's kind of my approach to a lot of things. I always just, I like helping people. I've always liked helping people. You know, I'm a social worker by background. I've just, it's what my mum was like. She just always wanted to help. So throwing myself into helping other people really helped me. You know, it's a really rewarding thing. And, you know, even whilst I'm struggling, recovering from mastectomy, people are asking me questions and I'm helping them prepare for their mastectomy. So yeah, that was, it's so therapeutic for me to share my journey and just to feel like, not to get sad or soppy, but I feel like uh, this was, I, this happened to me for a purpose. And my best way of looking at it in a positive light is to say, well, I've been through this. Therefore, other people are going to need help going through this. So that was kind of what I did. Um, And I remember, same with when my mum died, like none of my friends' parents have died. And I remember my best mate saying to me, in a really, she said it in the nicest way possible, but she was like, I'm so glad this has happened to you first because now you can, you'll be there for all of us. And I was like, I know I will. (laughs) I know. So all of these experiences that, I have had around BRCA, around cancer, loss, grief, all of that. I have just harnessed it as much as I can to try and help other people with it. And I'm not saying it hasn't been hard for me. You know, I've had really, I have had low days, but I've always, I feel privileged really. I've had a very, I have had a lucky life. I've had a lovely family. I've I've had enough in my life to make me resilient. And I, I do think I'm a very resilient person. So when I do have low days, I kind of know that that's just part of the, part of the ride, isn't it? Just riding yeah. those waves and you just got to, you've got to own it and be like, today's going to be a bad day. <laughs> I'll let it be a bad day, but tomorrow's a new day. So I have, yeah, a lot of, I guess, positivity and hope around that. Um, I get my main thing was anxiety about how I would look and how I would feel and you know sadly about my relationship and I would say the worst kind of did happen you know my relationship ended I left my house I had to change my job I had a mastectomy all of that and I'm it's you're still all right at the end of the day you're still all right so even when you're hitting your lowest and you feel like this is so crap you know it can't get any worse it can get a little bit worse, but it does always, it gets better. It really gets better. Um, and I, I quite often will say to other women when they're diagnosed and they're very upset about it, I will say the community is incredible. The BRCA community and the women I have met are just so inspirational. Sometimes I say it's even worth it just to be part of their gang. <laughs> Same with like cancer survivors and thrivers. Yeah. You're just all so wonderful. And you find that community and you find that mutual support. And I just I couldn't have done it without these strangers on the internet, you know? <laughs> it's amazing. It's, I call yeah. it the the secret, not so secret club because the, yeah. the moment you're diagnosed, all of this sudden people that you had no idea come out of the, you know, just to step out into the sunlight and say, I'm alive in this diagnosis and you will yeah. be too. And, you know, so that 
at least in the States, I don't know about over in the UK, but in the States, especially as we come up on Pinktober or, you know, Mm -hmm. Awareness Month, a lot of the image that you see, imagery that you see around breast cancer is, is, um, around loss, around death, right? So most of the times when you hear that word, when you're first diagnosed, you think, so this, this is it. I'm just basically delaying the inevitable and walking this path to my Mm -hmm. demise is kind of what it feels like initially. And, and if you haven't been around survivors, once you get around the survivors and thrivers, you're like, oh no, what cancer looks like is marathons. What cancer looks like is health and vitality. What cancer looks like is yoga. But, and it's not Mm -hmm. that you have your healthy self back. There are modifications that happen where, you know, I didn't realize I would have a lot of pain for (laughs) I didn't like, there are things I didn't, wasn't quite prepared for, but to still have that, that hope and that visual of being alive in your diagnosis and walking in friendship with it. That was something that was not communicated, at least not on the medical side and from a mental health perspective. But thankfully, like you said, those, that group of men and women who have been there, done that and are here Mm -hmm. to tell the story and walk with you. They're amazing. But that that's it, isn't it? You, you become so aware of your own mortality. Mm -hmm. If, you know, if you are a survivor or a survivor, if you're told you have a predisposition to cancer, you suddenly do not want to die. (laughs) Like, that's the feeling. It's like, oh, my God, am I not immortal? Wow, okay. And it does, I'm not trying to take away from the fact that losing your boobs and part of your body is not horrific, but it does put perspective on things. And I was, you know, I used to say, well, what's the point of me having boobs if I'm, if they're going to kill me? Like, they're not going to look great when I'm dead unburied. So yeah. it makes you, you lose your boobs, but you find so much more through the process. You know, you find your reason for living, you, you gain, yeah, new friends, new hobbies, all of that stuff, because you just want to live. And that, you know, that's been a gift for me, really, really has. You step outside of that whole just living and just try and make more for your life. Yeah, it it takes you beyond existing or even just acceptance of yeah, I I used to say how I was always banking on the future for that vacation, for that trip, for that experience, for that whatever. And now and and you know, putting up and tolerating a work environment that wasn't healthy and all of these things and now it's like I I genuinely don't have time for that. <laughs> I might, but I, I'm not going to tolerate it and I'm not going to compromise. And mm. so it really did free me up to create an authentic, intentional life that I enjoy waking up to and stepping into every moment, even though I do still have those days where, you know, it does, it occasionally hits you, the scansiety around getting scans on a regular basis, you know, like just yeah. showing up for those. Um, it, it's just still... on, on that point, actually, because um, if people are listening to this and thinking the only option is mastectomy, it isn't. Um, <clears throat> so the choices that we are given would be to have that regular screening. So as soon as you turn 30 in the UK, you will be having MRIs annually. Sometimes they choose to do it once every six months. That is in the hope of picking it up early. Not It's not prevention. Um, Because obviously your chances are much better if it's picked up early. So that's one choice. And then the other one is um, a, they call it chemo prevention. So you take certain drugs, the criteria is quite like limiting. So it's, it's not suitable for a lot of people, um, but it is also an option. So chemo prevention. Um, And then obviously it'll be your own regular checks. So make sure that you're always checking your boobies for any differences and, you know, all of that stuff we promote. So the mastectomy isn't, my surgeon said to me, if you, which kind of made it a bit harder, he said, if you were BRCA1, I would say definitely have the mastectomy because their chances are higher and at a younger age. And he said with BRCA2, yeah, he said, I'll be happy if you do regular screenings. I'll be happy if you have the mastectomy. So that was, that was difficult. I was kind of like, I wish you could make that decision for me. But 
just so people know there are different options, um, not just mastectomy. Thank you. That is really important. And you threw out a word earlier that I want to come back to. Yeah. You know, we talk about survivor and we talk about thrivers, but you mentioned previvor. And I think that's oh, really yeah. important. Yeah. Do you want to talk to us a little bit about that? Uh, the definition of that is pre- surviving a predisposition to cancer. So I'm not a survivor. I've never had cancer. I'm a provider because I prevented it before it got me. <laughs> so yeah, that's a kind of term that we use. We're all in the provider gang. <laughs> and, and in the US, you have um, the Breasties, which is incredible. Is it charity organization? Mm-hmm. They. I wish I lived there. You go on like retreats and you'll meet up and it just it's, it looks like such an incredible community. And we are slowly bringing it to the UK. We've got awesome. London breakfast now, but uh, yeah, hopefully that'll be growing over the next few years. But it's well established in the USA. <laughs> yes, which is cool. also wonderful. Absolutely. Yeah. So yeah. you have had... In one of the other reconstruction options I always ask about, because, I, and this is one where a lot of women are like, do I or don't I? And I was on the fence with it too. But did you have nipple reconstruction? I did not. Yeah. So I did. I've made a video about that recently because it seemed like totally 50-50 whether people had had it or not. Um, so the background of that, for me, they basically said, because... I had very big areola Mm -hmm. and because they were repositioning my skin and I was having a bit of a reduction, they would have looked ridiculous. At one point he said they might be under your armpits. And then he also said they would be too big and they would, they wouldn't be straight. They wouldn't be symmetrical. So aesthetically they wouldn't look fabulous. Um, And there is also a really small percentage, like one or 2%, very small of getting, cancer in the leftover tissue so for me I was like I can't I don't want to still have that anxiety just get rid of it all and you know I'll be happy with that a lot of women who I spoke to you know for my vlog on this said you know it's such a small chance they're going to take that risk and they didn't want BRCA a lot of them don't want BRCA to take everything from them Mm. and your nipple does make your boob look like a boob (laughs) It definitely does. Um, There is a small risk of something called necrosis, which is Mm -hmm. nipple or tissue death. Um, And confusingly, the more tissue they leave, the better chance there is of it kind of your body accepting that nipple. But the more tissue they leave, the more chance there would be of cancer. So it's a little bit, you know, it's a bit of a catch-22 really, isn't it? Um, So... Yeah, there's small chance of cancer. And for me, they would have looked ridiculous anyway. Um, For most people, they don't serve a function. So they don't have sensation. You can't get aroused by them. But this is developing. So there are new techniques being used at the moment where they keep the nerve. You talked about this earlier. You keep the nerve sensation. So hopefully for the future, nipples, (laughs) save the nipples. (laughs) Yeah, it looks like the option to keep nipples is more and more popular, more and more popular choice. Um, But I missed the boat on that one. (laughs) You know, I actually on the breast that had lobular, it had made it to the dermis and was in my nipple. So I couldn't keep that nipple. And once I talked with the plastic surgeon and this was five and a half years ago. And so, you know, the conversations that surgeons are having now about, um, preserving sensation versus the conversations I was having five and a half years ago, that conversation was, you know, you're, you're not going to have sensation anyway. And, mm-hmm. and we knew I had, uh, three tumors in the left breast. We didn't see anything in the right breast, but my type of cancer lobular is very sneaky. And in fact, I didn't with three masses and over six centimeters of tumor tissue, it wasn't palpable because of how it grows. Yeah. And so, um, I chose to just have both breasts and nipples and just <laughs> start, start everything at the same place and then we yeah. will reconstruct. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I think there is, you know, there, I would say there's kind of two camps of people who are just completely risk averse, take it all. And then someone would be like, 
it's only a tiny risk. <laughs> yeah. I well, just, it's just, it's interesting because I know for me, I didn't want to have the, the conversation every year with an insurance company about why it was I needed to have an MRI, MRI with contrast instead of just a mammogram on that breast. Mm-hmm. And so I don't know. I mean, I may have made a different decision had my cancer type been different if it was something that wasn't so sneaky and didn't hide like that. But um, yeah, in the end, it was just, it just seemed easier mentally more than anything to just get it all over with at once. Yeah. yeah. And so the main purpose is around aesthetics and mentally it should be easier for you because of the way you look and they still look like a boob, but the flip side is the anxiety. So then you're kind of, you're weighing that up really. Um, there are options for me. I'm sure same for you. I can have tattoos. Um, mm. You can use, um, what do you call them? Sil- would it be silicon? Yeah, I I had a I had a set of those and I and I have had nipple reconstruction which is an interesting thing because it they basically my plastic surgeon's amazing but it's not like uh nipple tissue it's the skin that's left and so I had nipple reconstruction and then I ultimately tattooed and I actually left my silicone nipples with my tattoo artist because oh, really? she was using them as, as a as a guide of you know like yeah. <laughs> tracing them, <laughs> them and on. coloration in the whole bit but yeah there yeah. are amazing prosthetic nipples that are out there and tattoos that are temporary or permanent. It's just something for me. I feel I might change my mind, but it just it just doesn't bother me. Like, and I feel like I would just be doing it to make them look like boobs. But the reality is, I don't have boobs anymore. And right. I say that to people, and people go, "Yes, you do. You still have boobs." I don't. Biologically, I do not have boobs. No. I've got silicon under my skin, and in clothes, you know, you can't. You can't tell at all, but there's something a little bit proud about me not having nipples. I'm like, this is my thing. <laughs> it's my party trick. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure, you know, I might change my mind. I've not got any tattoos, so I might do it just so I can say I've got a tattoo, but <laughs> it doesn't bother me much. You know, it's such an interesting thing. I, I, It's the same for me. I call them prosthetics, even though they're under my skin. It is a silicone like it's a, it's a, it's an implant. It's a medical device. It's not, yeah. it, you, you do kind of lose that attachment, I guess, in some ways. And, or I shouldn't say not that we all do, but I did. And so mm-hmm. that's been an interesting part of the process too. And, you know, the first thing I did was actually ink them full. Like I have a <laughs> Phoenix on one side and a dragon on the other. And um, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Went to town and nipple reconstruction came later and then nipple coloration came even later, probably because then I was just addicted to tattoos. I don't know. But <laughs> they are a work of art, aren't they? Like they are, yeah. as with any work of art, it develops over time. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. That is exactly yeah. it. Yeah. I so- say, sorry, I, no. I would say that I they've become part of me. So when I first had them done, I had no issue at all of putting topless pictures on the internet to help others, like just to show what it looks like. Whereas now I wouldn't do that because I think when I first had it done, it was like, these aren't me. My boobs have been removed. These aren't my boobs. And now, however, what, nine months down the line, I don't think I would do topless photos. They're still there. They're still on my Instagram, but I don't think I would do any recent ones. (laughs) I don't know. That's yeah. interesting. I know mine are on my uh, tattoo artist's Instagram and her mm-hmm. webpage. And I have posted um, as I was going through the tattoo process. And same thing. I mean, and honest, in the Facebook support groups, I'm more than happy to share photos, yeah. especially since I, I had under the muscle implants initially and I have over the muscle implants now. And, okay. and, the initial, the actual aesthetic of them does not look that different, but the animation I had under my, under the muscle was really bad, which is why we ended up going over the muscle. So having those conversations with people to same thing to help people go through it, because it is amazing. You know, your, <laughs> your surgeons are always going to show you their best work. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I saw any from my surgeons. I don't think I got a photo album full. 
Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It's just people on the internet who I'd seen. Um, and it does, I have had women say to me, oh, you know, you look so good. I took a photo of you to my surgeon. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. I wonder how many screenshots I am on other women's phones. Because I did that. <laughs> I took screenshots of other women's so I could show my friends and be like, look, these look great. (laughs) So, yeah. Exactly. I joke with my guy. I probably have more um, topless photos on my phone than he (laughs) he's ever had on his but because we do we share and it support one another and and we also celebrate right like that sense of reclamation of of finding joy and pride and self-love and self-acceptance and all of that again it's it's all very important to that it is I do feel as well like it is Just a note on social media, it can be if you're not in the right headspace and you start scrolling through Instagram, through Facebook, it can really mess you because sometimes people might be, you know, posting photos of complications. They might be having a really bad day saying, oh, my God, this is awful. Why is this happening to me? And if you are not in the right headspace, that can really shake you up a little bit. So that's my kind of warning. We're all like that with social media, unfortunately. We just jump on without thinking about it and just scroll mindlessly (laughs) all day long. So just, yeah, be aware that it is such a fantastic support that makes sure you are able to kind of cope with the bad as well as the good that you come across on there. Yeah, the you will find what you seek is also Mm -hmm. kind of an important part of that, if all you are looking to find are complications. And it's, I'm so glad you mentioned that because five and a half years ago, when I was first diagnosed, I didn't find what I see now, as far as as many support groups and images and things like that. So it really Mm -hmm. was Google and I, and Google more than anything was the complications and things like that, because it was medical journals and, you know, that's where a lot of the images were coming from. And so thankfully that has really transitioned and really changed. But now we have, you know, women on the cover of Inked that have been, you know, had art over their scars and whether they've had their aesthetic flat closure, whether they've had flat, whether they've been reconstructed or somewhere in between. And so there is much more acceptance. And I love what you're doing. And the reason I think it's so important to podcast about it, because we need to have these conversations out in the open and not just behind closed doors and in back rooms, because for whatever reason, and I don't know about the UK, I have a feeling you guys aren't as uptight about breasts maybe as we are over here on the state side, but you know, like we don't talk about them. We have them all over like every car burger advertisement there is, Mm -hmm. but when it comes to being part of what is important to a woman and her femininity and her sexuality and sensuality, that's where we kind of like, "Mm, we don't, we don't talk about that. Oh, just how society's views on breasts has really damaged (laughs) women's bodies. Like you, like you say, they used to advertise KFC and yet breastfeeding in public is still very much a taboo thing it's just utterly ridiculous and if oh you ask anybody what the point of a breast is most most people will say to breastfeed a baby but there's been this whole yeah just we're completely objectified from, from our bodies yep. and it does make it harder to talk about I think over the last you know few years we've come in the UK at you know a really long way in terms of talking about breast health there's incredible charity called Copperfield here which have just I think completely transformed younger women's approach to checking their boobs and talking about boobs and bodies and we're getting there we're definitely getting there um but I'd say some people are still very uncomfortable talking about it yeah they really are Yeah, it is definitely interesting. Even when I started the podcast, I said to my editor, can I, can I say nipple? Like the fact that I'm even asking that question, can I say it? Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) So, all right. You, oh my goodness, such, such an inspirational story. And one of the questions I always love to ask my guests, especially those that have been in the trenches, Kristen, what advice would you want to leave with our listeners as we think about breast cancer, breast health, and really overall health? So I would say it's a very hard thing. I know it's easier said than done, but if you have a BRCA mutation, 
try and think of it as a wonderful opportunity to live a longer life because you know our relatives weren't so lucky and this is rel- a new thing that's been discovered you know if my mum knew that she had it she'd still be alive so a lot of people see BRCA as a cancer diagnosis and it is not a cancer diagnosis it's an opportunity to you know save yourself and in terms of preventative surgeries they are really terrifying and really anxiety provoking but hand on heart for me a woman who loved her boobs and had fantastic rack you will get through it and you will be pleased and you will view your body in a whole different light and you will respect it in a completely different way so I know you will be anxious but if anything just reach out speak to other people in the community you know get on Instagram watch my videos on YouTube just just to see that the journey is it's life changing, but that doesn't have to be a negative thing. It can be a really positive thing. So yeah, just that there's hope and yeah, just spin that, spin that thought process a little bit and try and focus on the positives of it. I love that. And mm-hmm. I mentioned your video blog, but where can folks find you? I, you have a great Instagram, um, which yeah. are my beautiful images. Your videos are perfect. <laughs> so where can people find you? And topless pictures. <laughs> Um, so my YouTube is BRCA Chatter, so B-R-C-A Chatter. So like I'm chatting about it, which I always am. Um, and so is my Instagram and Twitter, so BRCA Chatter, and they're all kind of linked together. So whenever I post anything on YouTube, I'll put it on my Instagram as well. So you can get through all of those realms to get there. Um, yeah. I and love I just, it. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me on. Like it's been so wonderful talking about it. Always, always love getting stuff off my chest. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> Literally and figuratively. <laughs> I love it. Literally and figuratively. Oh, yeah. I, thank you so much for being on the show, for bringing awareness, doing the advocacy work you do, and really for being such a light, a beacon of light and hope and energy and enthusiasm, humor in what could be a dark space with everything that you do in bringing awareness and helping folks like myself who needed a little more information and didn't know as much about BRCA and for all of those listeners that have been diagnosed with a BRCA mutation. Thank you so much for being here, Kristen. Thank you. (laughs) Thank you. All right, listeners, thank you so much for tuning in again and listening to Your Killer Life. Another great episode, another great guest. If you haven't done it yet, click that like, click the subscribe, click the bell. And hey, while you're at it, head on over to Bracket Chatter and click some likes and bells and stuff over there too and give Kristen a follow. And until next time, keep building your killer life.